Okay, so a little bit better late than never, but we are recording here. It's the 10th of January. So this is our little white-footed mouse, and, you know, so again, there are lots of them. They're nocturnal, they eat anything, and they are actually tremendously ecologically important, which I didn't realize. So now, let's talk, whoops. Oh, how cute, baby mice. Lots of baby mice. So, Paramiscus leucopus. They are polygynandrous. Exactly. What does poly mean? The prefix poly means? Many. Polygons have many sides. Um, things that are polymorphic, because morph means what? Shape. Shape. Things that are polymorphic have many shapes. They are polygynandrous. Huh? You ever heard of polygamy? Polygamy? Multiple marriages. Multiple individuals in a marriage. So polygyny, gyne, refers to females, the gynecologist. Uh -huh. My grandmother would have said it's the doctor that looks at your lady parts. <laughs> gynecologist, yes, is the doctor who takes care of uterus, ovaries, vulva, vagina, all that stuff. It's the lady parts doctor. Um, <laughs> because that's really how people used to refer to it, because it's too embarrassing to say uterus. Okay. Um, polygyny is one male with multiple females. Gyne. Now, and, have you heard of the hormone androgen? It's one of the two hormones that make males look like males. The other is testosterone. Um, androgen contributes a lot of what we think of as the sexual, secondary sexual characteristic beards and shoulders and um well now there's a lot of testosterone actually there um but like the the facial hair the deepening voice the thickening of vocal cords that's androgen um so polyandry is one female with multiple male partners polygynandry is multiple females with multiple males Everybody's reproducing with everybody. It's a party. To quote one of your class. It sounds like a party. It is. One female mouse will mate with, you know, four, five, six, ten males. One male mouse will mate with as many females as he can find. Everybody's mating with him. <laughs> it's quite a little party going on down there in the field. You have no idea what things those little mice are up to. Um, they, they are mating... Everybody with everybody. All the, it, it, it's, it, they're, good at, they're good at, what's their purpose? Making more. Making more mice. They're really good at it. And females will have litters of like 8 to 14 pups. They call them pups. Um, now, she can get pregnant like 40 days after she's born. And he can impregnate a mouse about 40 days after he's born. They are fertile. Wait, so are they are. Huh? Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Well, now, of course, we have to remember. Well, we'll talk about some characteristics here. Um, females can become pregnant while they're still nursing pups from their past litter. That's not an impediment to progress. She can give birth on Tuesday and get pregnant again on Friday with a load of pups nursing. It's craziness. Now, here's an interesting bit. Gestation lasts 22 to 28 days. So do you know what gestation is? It's how long a mammal keeps, how long a mammal stays pregnant, how long a mammal keeps their offspring in their uterus. So in humans, gestation is how long? Nine months. Nine months. In elephants, I think it's 18 months. In horses, it's like 11. Um, rabbits are like 32 days. Um, it varies from species to species. But in mice, gestation, 22 to 28 days, that's a big range. I mean, six days, when you're talking about 20 days, that's like a third of the time. So that's like if you said, well, a human female could be pregnant for anywhere from 9 to 12 months. Whoa. They can delay implementation of their fertilized eggs. This is a huge evolutionary advantage. So first of all, 
this, this polygynandry is a huge evolutionary adaptation for them. Um, why does she want to mate with five or ten males? Because if she's going to have a litter of 14 pups and they've got seven different fathers in there, because they can do that, um, she is maximizing the chances that one of those fathers is an absolute rock star and that that offspring is going to survive and pass on her genes because she's playing the lottery here. She's mixing her DNA with some little mouse who she never met before. Um, well, I mean, seriously. Um, it's a wild sex party in the field with these little guys. So, you know, and for the males, if they're mating with, you know, as many females as they can, they're spreading their DNA out as far as they can because they don't have a hand in raising the pups. They're gone. They never see the pups. So they want to produce as many pups as possible with as many possible mothers as possible to maximize the chances that their DNA makes it into the next generation. So with the de delay of fertilized egg, we're going we're gonna to go through some sort of reproductive biology here. This... And I'm, I'm going to use the model of a female human because I don't know how to draw a mouse, ovary, and uterus. Okay? That is a uterus. That's an ovary. Ova refers to egg. It's Latin for egg. Ovaries are where eggs are made. And this is the little fallopian tube. We'll call it FT for short. So in humans, once a month... An egg is released from the ovary, goes down the fallopian tube, travels to the uterus. If nothing happens, a woman has a period, the lining of the uterus is shed, la, 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 go on with your merry day. If between here and here that egg meets a sperm, it can become fertilized. So then, presto, we have a magic fertilized egg. We'll make that one green. If we get a fertilized egg, is that a baby? Not necessarily. That, that doesn't even mean that there's a chance of a baby yet because something else has to happen. What did I say mice can delay? Implantation. implantation. That fertilized egg has to successfully implant in the wall of the uterus. If it finds a good place to implant, it will start to grow. Oh, we'll see if you guys get this. In placental mammals... It has to implant, and then the body has to respond by growing a pl placenta. Yeah, the body has to start growing a placenta. If all that happens and all that proceeds, then we're on our way to possibly a future creature of whatever species. Here we're talking about humans. Um, in mice, in white-footed mice, if the female is stressed out, if she's scared, if she's starving, if there aren't abundant resources her body will hold on to that fertilized egg. You know, in a, in a human female, if that egg doesn't implant, it just keeps on going. It's over. There's no pregnancy. In a female mouse, that egg can, like, kind of get set on the shelf for six days. And then during that period, if conditions improve, like, okay, she gets enough to eat, she's got enough calories, or, you know, whatever the threat is goes away, okay, then her body will allow that egg to implant. And there are a lot of species that do something like this. Also, if she gets stressed out, her body will just sort of reabsorb the embryos. The pregnancy just disappears. So female mice, and again, this is a fantastic evolutionary adaptation. Basically, if she's stressed, if she's not getting enough nourishment, if she's not getting enough calories, if she's lost, you know, you just move that sheet of corrugated metal that's been down in the field um, for three months, and when you moved it, there was a mouse nest under it, and you kicked the mouse nest, and it all scattered, and this little mouse ran away. Well, if she's holding on to a fertilized egg, you just freaked her out, and she is definitely not implanting that egg today, <laughs> you know, because she's stressed. So they can actually do this delaying implementation of fertilized eggs. What this allows them to do, they are so good at their job. Oh, my gosh, they are so good at their job. So... Let's think about it in terms of a little graph of population growth. So these are weeks. As weeks go by, this is number of mice. And we'll say this is 5, 10, 15, etc. Um, weeks, number of mice. So if we start off with 
two mice in week one. Four weeks later, somewhere here, we might have ten mice. She can get pregnant again almost immediately. So four weeks later, we might have 20 mice. Well, then we're eight weeks out. Guess what? Her babies are more than capable of getting pregnant on their own. So they tend to. So we, we might have, you know, 50 some. And then we might, and it starts to look like this <laughs> real fast. This is called exponential growth. Um, I will tell you briefly about my friend Sally in college sally got she had had mice as a kid pet mice she thought it'd be fun to have a couple mice again so she bought two mice off some mouse breeder and she said now you're sure they're both females right and the mouse breeder said absolutely they had well they weren't both females um so they had babies she only had she had one she had them in one tank they had babies oh crap this one's a male so she separated the two adults and then the mama was with the babies. And then a few weeks later, like three weeks later, she separated out the babies. And she thought she figured out which ones were males and which ones were females. It's really hard, to, it's really hard to tell. Um, six months down the road, she had over 80 mice in her house. She couldn't get it under control. She sold some to a pet store. They gave her like, you know, 25 or 50 cents each for them. And she ended up finding a guy who was breeding pythons. And he took them all. <laughs> and she decided to never have mice again. Because it was completely out of control. It was exponential growth. What was Sally lacking in their little ecosystem? Whoops. What was she lacking? She was lacking predators. <clears throat> Nothing was keeping their population in check. So they were growing exponentially. It was crazy. And it was, it was kind of stinky, too. They had an empty bedroom upstairs. They, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> I remember that period. It was terrible. Um, okay, so that's wonderful. We know a little bit about mice. They're good at making other mice. They're ecologically important. Lots of things like to eat them. They spread spores around. But let's look at this adorable little creature. This mouse is the primary host for the Lyme bacteria. This is what we're going to pick up tomorrow, but I do want to talk about this. You'll, you'll get this slide tomorrow when we copy it. So we're going to, you might want to do some discussion. We're not done. Um, look at how adorable that little mouse is. Look at its big eyes. Look at its big ears. Look more closely at its ears. Yes, there are. Guess what those are? They're deer ticks. What life stage? Hmm? Larva. Larva, yes. They are larval ticks. And this little mouse is covered in them. And unfortunately for the ticks, white-footed mice are reservoirs. They are sort of storage places for Lyme bacteria. And those little ticks that are biting that mouse are probably getting that bacteria in their guts, which they can then pass on. So <clears throat> the weird thing, and this is where we're going to start asking questions tomorrow. You guys, a lot of you have known somebody who had Lyme. It wreaks havoc on your body. I know somebody who had it undiagnosed for years, and I mean, he's got permanent joint damage, and he had all kinds of issues, you know. White-footed mice don't, for the most part, seem to be affected by this bacteria. They've got it all through their bloodstream, and yet they don't seem to be affected by it. So the question we're going to start on tomorrow is how can they tolerate having this disease-causing bacteria in their bloodstream? Because they are the reservoir for the bacteria. And they're adorable. Questions, comments on mice? Thoughts? I'm going to put this on the video so we remember to talk about it, but we should talk about coevolution and think back to things like our unit that we started the year with. Just good thoughts, good interesting thoughts. Okay. <clears throat>